when it comes to justice, somebody stole something from you. They stole your jobs, they stole your time, they stole the ability to bury your grandparents rightly. There have been injustices done, and he's not asking for that to be repaid in any kind of way. He's saying, just get over it. That is not biblical, that's not just. Hi, I'm Evelyn Ray. Welcome to The Cauldron Pool Show. Today is a pretty awesome episode. We are having a crossover with the guys from Cross Politic, and I'm super excited to get into all things um, that's going on in the world with, you know, that in one hand and the Bible in the other. And without further ado, I just want to welcome you guys to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having us, Evelyn. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, great to be here. Awesome. Now, before uh, we sort of get into the nitty gritties of things, one of you guys, please, could you volunteer? I'd love for you to plug your podcast, tell my audience over here, um, you know, what you sort of want to achieve with your podcast, what you do, uh, how often you do it and where people can go to sort of listen and tune in as well. Well, since this will be the extent of what I'm able to answer on the show, I'll go ahead and take take this question. Oh, no. I don't think that's true. Yeah, I'm just yeah. kidding. Um, so cross politic is uh, um, cross politic. Jesus is Lord over politics. And we started it in 2016 because uh, um, here in America, uh, at least in my generation, the last 40 years, uh, the church has not done a very good job discipling or teaching its people how to apply the, ball, uh, the Bible to politics. Um, there is no such thing as separation between religion and state. It's inescapable. Every state's going to have a religion. And Christians have been taught to put their faith, to hide their faith, or they've been taught some sort of secular neutral view of society. And so we wanted to explicitly uh, talk about how the Bible applies to politics. And that was our mission since 2016. And it hasn't changed. Yeah. Hmm. And all three of you still come every week, hey, with each other. And um... oh, it's every day. (laughs) Every day. (laughs) Worse than, we, we, worse than that we we sit down at this table with gabe yeah every day <laughs> it's a lot of sanctification it's, it's it's a great way for free counseling <laughs> that's true <laughs> i've learned a lot over the last couple of years yeah. oh man so you guys kind of emerged during like the trump sort of era like 2016 would that be a fair statement Oh, wow. I never thought about it like that, but I guess that's yeah. true. I think it was, yeah, I think providentially. I don't know that we planned it that way, but I think. Remember, we started our first cap, our first podcast dropped in September 2016. Right. And Trump got elected November 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And none of us voted for Trump then, I don't think. No, I know no, I did. No, nah. I didn't. I didn't vote for him. And and then we all voted, or at least I know I voted for him in 2020. But um, it, when Trump became president, I think everyone was shocked um, or yeah. A lot of America was shocked. I mean, you saw Hillary Clinton's fans crying and tearing up. And yeah, it was like watching a film. Yeah. The election night, because yeah. I stayed up. I was like, oh, Trump's not going to win. Yeah. And then uh, all, all of a sudden, <laughs> all those news anchors like watching uh, their faces. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> something yeah. must be wrong. It was, yeah. great. <laughs> it was great. So I, I do think that ha- that contributed to us kind of growing because you had all of a sudden you had the evangelical church who had not been taught well to apply the Bible to politics. Well, that year, all of a sudden, every all media outlets started blaming evangelicals for electing Trump. Right. You remember that? <laughs> and and so now all these evangelicals who voted for Trump um, probably didn't really even have solid reasons for it or whatever, but they were being put in the crossfire, the cultural crossfire hairs for, hey, it's your fault we got Trump. And so they, I think a lot of them started tuning in because they wanted to have more of a biblical basis for why they did what they did Mm. i also Mm. think i also think that i I mean so i think that was the kind of the initial bump yeah and then i think covid yeah oh yeah 2020 was actually i think where we really kind of absolutely uh, went went went, hey hey wire went bonkers because when everything shut down um you know i mean media was considered one of the essential services and with everything kind of closed down we were like before that i think we were doing Two shows a week. Two shows a week. Yeah. Yep. And it was during COVID that we decided to just go daily. Yeah. And we just started doing a daily show because I mean, I mean, everybody was talking about it all day long. And we just wanted to fill that void and say, oh, but but are are we thinking about this biblically? Are we right. are we are we being um thoughtful? Are we cross-examining the data? Um, and we and pretty pretty quick from jump, all of us had certain suspicions and 
concerns that eh, we weren't getting um, the straight, you know, scoop. And there were different reasons uh, for really questioning the narrative that That's we were right. being given. And uh, it was an alternative voice either. And there, and there was no, nobody actually, yeah, nobody providing any kind of alternative yeah. voice. Yeah. Hmm. We have a similar thing over here in Australia where we just, um, we keep them very separate politics and Christianity. And I've always found it interesting when people say, you know, church and state. And I always think, where do you know where that came from? It was actually to keep the, the state out of the church, not the, not the other way around. Massive misconception. But I think that's how Satan works. He takes something good and he manipulates it and changes it. Um, to suit his own sort of evil uh, agenda or subversion of whatever goodness God reflects through us down here. Um, but you mentioned before that there wasn't really an alternative voice for things. Do you have similar problems to us? Because in Australia, we, uh, we just have our mainstream media over here, um, which is tax funded, government funded, like that's, you know, pretty red flags right there. And there's not really many other options for us. I think America is a little bit bigger, but I was curious your input on that. Yeah, I, you know, I think we have a broader uh, variety of voices. Uh, we, at least during COVID, though, we didn't. Everybody in COVID lockstep did the exact same thing, even our more conservative media. So I think there's only two different options here in in America for news. You have the left, which is every other news station, ABC, NBC, Fox. Uh, um, hold on, <laughs> uh, I, 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 we'll get there. Uh, you, you name them; they're all on one voice, kind of left leaning, and hard, then hard left. and hard left. And then you have Fox, and Fox has a variety. So you got some people who try to straddle the middle. You have some people who are further on the right, just kind of the rah-rah Republican, this, that, and the other thing. And then you had this weird phenomenon, which was Tucker Carlson. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. which, um, so we had, he came, they came out a little later though with the COVID. They weren't all, everybody was slow on the tick of, of COVID. They did not jump on that at all. But we do have a right. The other thing that we have is um, uh, there's a lot of people on social media that are trusted news sources. And so, um, Individual journalism uh, that is not necessarily connected to the the big names is still a trusted source, which is why you had so much of a lockdown on social media during the time of COVID. We trusted other folks that we have been listening to for years around news. Mm. And so we saw such a clampdown on what could be said on social media because it was the only free place to talk that wasn't in lockstep with all of the other major networks out there. So I think we have way more variety. We have way many, we have more options in, um, but in COVID, they, it really narrowed down to just one. Well, two, if you count YouTube. Yeah. It's, it's interesting how COVID really kind of put a lot of issues um, under the, I guess, magnifying glass. I think a lot of these issues might've already previously been there, but maybe we hadn't been tested before. Um, right. In, in, in Australia, like I've, I've been on your episode and I sort of gave a little bit of a testimony of what it was like over here in Australia for the church. But I wanted to sort of, you know, as we saw a lot about John MacArthur's church and how he took a stand and in the end, you know, praise God, um, he won, especially like not just, we already knew like he did the right thing, but from a legal perspective, um, that was like really encouraging that he he won that as well. But in terms of your everyday local churches, you know, your smaller churches, um, what was the response like in America during COVID? Was it as bad as us? <laughs> Catastrophic <laughs> failure. Uh, That's what it was. You know, I, I, mean, I know you're asking about kind of the, the generic American church. I actually want to point something out about the MacArthur thing that I think is actually really worth highlighting yeah which is that um macarthur's church did not initially that's right make the right call um and and, it, okay. and, I, and i'm i'm not i'm actually not highlighting this to to diss no, them not at all yeah i disagreed with them initially but they put out a statement initially that said we need to obey the civil magistrates we need to honor them we need to stay closed and, and it was a romans 13 just kind of straight we're going to obey them and then I don't know how much it was like two months, maybe a month or two yeah. later, they put out a statement reversing course completely yeah. saying we were wrong. We they mm. the, the civil magistrate is abusing their authority. Yeah. 
They should not be running the church this way. We were wrong. We repent. We're opening. We're here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And 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 that and that's like I mean actually like I want to praise that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Me too. I want to I want to give them the highest highest kudos because I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, the number of churches that and they're just so um, public. I mean, they're they're such yeah. a well known church. Yeah. I, but I'm just not, frankly, not aware of very many churches at all that whether during the pandemic or even after, you know, even down to the present that it said, we repent. Basically, we were wrong. We got right. this wrong. Right. And I, I've seen maybe five videos on Facebook okay. or YouTube that have other churches said I was wrong. There's that one Baptist pastor yep. I've seen you guys. There's, there's like, there's like yeah. five that I've seen. And I'm, I'm scurrying all yeah. over the, yeah. Yeah. so to so find five, that's very yeah. but rare. I, but I just, I just want to highlight that that's actually, I think part of the, heroicism yes. of, of MacArthur and, and the men that, that lead that church, I, I think is, is as much, not only the stand, but it's, it's that repentant that's yeah. stand. That's right. Which, I mean, I, I mean, that's what we need. Yeah. I mean, we, we need, we need churches in this land uh, across the world yeah. that are, that are, that have the courage to repent. Mm-hmm. That, that's the, that's the thing. Like it's, it's, it, and we don't have that. And, and I, you know, and then to your, to the central question about like, well, how did, most churches handle it. I would say most churches completely face planted. Yeah. Um, m- most churches closed down. Most churches obeyed. Um, the churches that have, um, you know, even a, a sort of a doctrinal reformed backbone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Almost mm-hmm. all entirely caved. Yeah. Um, you know, there were there they're were... still wearing masks at last Presbytery. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> no. Yeah. What? Which Presbytery? Uh, no, our, I'm saying PCA Presbytery. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, not ours, uh, not ours. But, uh, but the, like, I mean, there were, you know, there were uh, in, in California, there was regulations that said no singing. Yeah. In in churches, mm-hmm. um, you could only meet a certain number of people. You know, had to social distance only a certain number of people within a per- particular square footage, mm-hmm. um, and no singing. And there were some, I I understand some even you know reformed churches that were like, okay, well then no singing, and and like yeah. to, like completely disobeyed God yeah. in order to honor the civil magistrate. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think by and large, uh, the, the American church really failed. Now I would, I would add that there's um, a bunch of churches that didn't um, comply it kind of at the, at the grassroots level. And, um, but they didn't really, um, you know, they're just doing their thing. They were still worshiping, showing up, and, and they didn't really any have any any public re- response or stand, but they were also able to go under the radar. Kind of so, did it under the radar. Yeah, but there was. I think the, the in terms other, of like all the big churches, like Mark Dever, like the yeah, the, the, the leadership the, churches, the leadership the, churches in the U.S. It, it was a catastrophe. I think the we're part of um, a, a small Presbyterian denomination called the Communion of Reformed Evangelical Churches, about a hundred or so churches. Um, uh, most of which are in North America, but we do actually have a few scattered a- around the world. Um, I believe that um, we may be one of the only denominations um, pretty early on. Yeah. Um, our um, we call it kind of the our, our our elected leader, presiding minister. Um, he put out a letter on behalf of our denomination um, with, right. within a month or two yeah. of of a bunch of the lockdowns pushing back and basically respectfully telling our civil magistrates that they did not have the right to instruct churches on how we would meet um, and, um, and, and informed various magistrates that we would be doing what God requires us to do and we, we would not be com- complying with um, any uh, requirements that we found to be, um, you know, onerous or, or um, uh, unacceptable according to the word of God. Um, so I'm I'm really grateful for that, but I mean that's you know all of maybe a hundred churches, yeah. um, and I, I mean I know there were other exceptions like you're mentioning, Gabe, um, but certainly nothing that really other than MacArthur's church, uh, n- not a, a very very strong front that really pushed yeah. back. Well, I love that. <sighs> Unfortunately, that's partially true. Except for maybe a couple Calvary chapels. Uh, yes, <laughs> and a few charismatic folks. One in Florida, Rodney Howard Brown, Rodney yeah, Howard yeah. Brown, who yeah. everybody considers a heretic, mm-hmm. was clear on this one. Yeah, right. And it was disappointing in one sense because it, it kind of showed me that we didn't really understand. We didn't know how to read the the, the field very well. Yeah, Rodney Howard Brown sends up here and says, "Okay, we're going to have church service. We're not going to change anything." He even he went and got the vents in they, his they church. Put extra filtration they, system they, in their church. The whole nine. And they came and arrested him. Yeah. Helicopter and all. And everybody's like, well, he's a heretic. But they don't know that. 
<laughs> they probably have to look at his doctrinal statement and figure yep. out, oh, he's a heretic. He's a Christian. That's him. all they say. Yeah. All they saw when he's a Christian is like, if they're going to come after him, they're going to come after you. Yep. Some of the charismatic folks, my charismatic brother, got some of this right before others, nope. but they're not as uh, informed, not as well known, I think, in, a, in American uh, Christianity yeah. so much, but there was another sect of the charismatic church, which I'm watching wearing masks and afraid to come and meet with each other. And I'm like, look, if anybody is going to sit up here and have church, it'd be the folks who can cast out demons. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I just would have thought they're doing healing. Yeah, yeah. I got that anointing and stuff on you. Yeah. Why don't you speak to that spirit and kill it out? Like, what's going on? And so, COVID, you have no power yeah. over was, me and our people. I was disappointed in him. Uh, Did you see a, that great, uh, funny uh, meme that was going around with Kenneth Copeland and how he did? Oh, I'll have to yeah. send it to you guys yeah. after this. How he like yeah. breathes like this in the. Oh man, it, yes, I was in. I was on the floor with that one with stomach cramps from laughing so much. I'll send it to you guys. You can watch it afterwards. <laughs> I didn't actually know that about John MacArthur's church. I only sort of heard the the glory side of it. Not that not that initially, um, he got it wrong, sort of thing. But like you right. mentioned, um, he he made it right. And I think that's the important takeaway from all of this. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy for us to get things wrong. Like we are literally d depraved in our nature. Like we we are sinners at heart. So it is so easy for us to get it wrong. But what is so hard is when we get it wrong and have to admit that. And the fact that they did that, um, I think is, is really good. And something that we haven't seen in Australia and it sounds like in America is the repentance. And I, I had Doug Wilson on the podcast and so many people messaged me and said, can you ask him as a, like from an Australian perspective, how do we go back to church now that the government has opened and said, you're allowed to go to church. There are pastors who are saying, okay, you can come back now. And congregants are saying, hey, well, how do we do this? Like, how do I just forgive? And Doug said to me, um, well, you don't have to, if they haven't asked you for forgiveness, you don't, you don't need to necessarily forgive them and just move on and go to their church, like find another church if they haven't repented of yeah. their sin. Um, and it's like, if, if we didn't need to seek for repentance, there would be no reason for hell if it was just offered freely. So he sort of painted it like that. And it was a really helpful sort of perspective, but yeah, it's quite shocking that even from your guys and there's not many churches that are repenting at all and i sent through um an article i'm just going to read it here from christianity today they put it out i think a few days ago and it says our pandemic divisiveness wasn't helpful in 2020 2021 or 2022 and carrying those divisions and hurts into the future would be worse and man if there's ever a ratio, I feel like this is a great example of a ratio. The comments, people in there are just livid um, and sort of saying that this is so similar to telling an abusive wife, uh, sorry, an abused wife to just get over it, move on. Your husband beat you up, just get over it, come on. Um, <laughs> what, what did you guys, did you read this article? What did you think of it? What did you make of it? Well, I read it. And it's a shame that someone who teaches ethics doesn't seem to have any ethics about them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. Now, this is Paul Miller, if I remember correctly, right? Yep. He teaches ethics. He's a, he, and he's on the ERLC of the SBC. Oh, are you serious? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, he's yeah, he's part of... We had him on the show. Did, did we I, think, have I, think we had, I think we had Paul. I, I would remember if we had Paul on. Okay. I don't think we did. I'll, but, Paul, you I'll are welcome to come on any yeah, time. Either way. But this is a, He's proven exactly the problem with COVID. When COVID happened, no one had any biblical ethics on how we handled the situation. No one knew what the scripture required of the federal government. No one knew what the scripture required of the church and of individuals. We didn't have any sort of saturated theological ethics on how we handled the situation. And so when it happened, everybody said, well, just do whatever they say, the government says. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the scripture requires. Does the federal government have responsibility to protect people? Absolutely. And guess what? Leviticus lays out their duties and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Where are their limits? How far can they go? It also lays out what your duties and responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. who, is, who is the person who's control of health? We've talked about this so much on the show. God gives the responsibility of health and welfare to the family. 
They are primarily responsible for taking care of themselves. The federal government is responsible for making sure that things don't go any further. So if they find something that is like a, a, a disease, they quarantine that disease there, not all the healthy people, mm -hmm. the sick ones. Mm -hmm. Well, as somebody who teaches ethics, he should know that. And shame on him that he doesn't. You need to stop teaching ethics if you don't know what the Bible says about this. That's right. And so when it comes to justice, somebody stole something from you. They stole your jobs. They stole your time. They stole the ability to bury your grandparents rightly. That's right. There have been injustices done, and he's not asking for that to be repaid in any kind of way. He's saying, just get over it. That is not biblical. Mm -hmm. That's not just. That's way more towards a secular idea of how things operate. And so, I'm sorry, Pastor, go ahead. You jump in here anytime because I can go forever uh, well, on this. I, I don't want to stop jumping. I mean, there's, that was a good sermon. I, I got more. Uh, uh, no, I, I was going to was gonna, was gonna throw out there. I mean, like, and my guess is mm. that if we were talking about, oh, I don't know, racism in America. Oh, boy. I, I want to see him write the same article. Yeah. Right. But guys, it's been difficult. There's right. been divisions. Let's just get over it. Amnesty. Yeah. You know, he'd be fired on spot. On, on the spot. But if you wrote the same article about racism, that's, exactly that's right. right. But that tells you that what he's really saying is it, for all the rhetoric of how much this matters and how this much is hurt, he doesn't actually mean that. Because mm -hmm. if we're if we were talking about something that he actually meant, he'd be saying, guys, we need to deal with this. There have been actual wrongs. There needs to be restitution. We need yeah. to put things yes. right. Um, and he would never write this article about the racial divisions in our country. I don't even think he knows what was actually broken, which is the problem, right? Right? Like he doesn't know what, I mean, right. we were just, we had Jay Bhattacharya and we had Ryan Cole on the show and these, these uh, epidemiologists and economists. Um, and uh, what is uh, Ryan, uh, Dr. Ryan Cole, he's a he's epidemiologist a, too, uh, right? He's an epidemiologist. Uh, he was a pathologist. Yeah, pathologist. Right. pathologist lab. He, yeah. and, he, and he previously and, owned a lab. And yeah. one of the things that Jay Bhattacharya said on the show is that they no one took into account all the domino effects of shutting down just the schooling aspects of it right. for for every for other countries in the world and just dealing with Uganda hundreds and millions of people have been sold off into slavery with their chi their children selling them off into slavery because there wasn't any education for them there. There wasn't any way for them to um operate and to to the to, engine of the American economy um, sh hurt Uganda significantly because countries we shut around, down countries, countries around the world, world. particularly it's Uganda. He referenced because he had data from it, and he said um, that about four million kids uh, left the public school system in Uganda alone. Yes, and he said they'll probably never return, and right. then sold off into sex slave yep. because that was the way that they saw that they would be able to have a future and make, make money, money and put food on the table. Mm. And you want to write me a letter about the repentance of no? If if you want to if you want to write an article. The article should have read, it's time to repent of our pandemic sins and our anemic Christianity. That's the name yeah. of the article that he should have That's had. Right. And he should have laid out those sins. He's acting as if masking was harmless. Do you know, there's articles now that we have talking about how babies are having a hard time adapting to people because they never saw mm. faces for two years. Yeah, right. And you yeah. act like this is a small thing. This is not that. This is not small. So people really did commit crimes against humanity, and they need to repent. Is there forgiveness for those people who repent? Absolutely. Always. Just like with John MacArthur and his church. They saw that they were going the wrong way. They repented, and we will champion those guys all day long for what they did. But until you repent, until you actually name the sins and repent them and say, we were wrong, we shouldn't have done it, this wasn't that hard really to see. Yeah, I think— I think one of the other things just to throw out there, I'm 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 skimming through this, this article right now, but like, and I think this is the point you're making. The thing that Jay Bhattacharya has, has, has emphasized a bunch of times, and I I would strongly urge um, your yeah. your viewers, your listeners, check out Jay Bhattacharya, Stanford uh, professor, um, one of one of the early early guys. Yes, wrote a op ed I think in the Washington Post or Washington Street. Journal, or, or Wall Street yeah. Journal, yeah. Um, Washington, Wall Street, uh, questioning um, the data early on uh, has risked basically his career, his <laughs> livelihood. Yes, um, to begin asking questions, uh, was one of the co-authors of the Great Barrington Declaration. It, um, uh, encourage your audience to check out the Great um, Barrington Declaration. He and two other um, uh, uh, PhDs um, wrote this statement about um, you know the, the facts, the truth of, of the of, of what we know about COVID and what we've learned. Um, and you could sign it still, but it's it's a it's a really wonderful uh, 
countermeasure. But but the thing that he's emphasized a bunch is that it was it, the, the way that the narrative was set up. It was sort of lives versus versus um, money. Yeah. Or lives versus economy versus economy. Yeah. Lives. Ver and there, and, and that was the way that the narrative was set up. And it was like, basically, you know, what are you going to pick? Are you, do you care about human lives or do you care about your stuff? You selfish pig. Um, <laughs> and, 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 but Jay says, no, 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 no. The economy is about lives. lives. It's about <laughs> human life. It was never lives stuff. It was always lives versus, yeah. versus lives. Yes. And, and that's that's what Knox is getting at. But even in this article from Christianity Today, that's all he talks about. This this guy, um, Paul Miller, all he talks about is, um, you know, that basically he's comparing lives lost to um, maybe the things we wanted to do weren't very effective. Right. Mm. That's, right. The, that's the comparison he makes is mm. lives lost to maybe masks didn't work as well as, as we thought. Lives lost versus maybe uh, we were a little divisive in our church attendance. We needed more grace. We needed more grace. And it's like, no, no, you don't get it. It was lives lost versus millions of lives lost. Yeah. Like, how, how many uh, cancer screenings were missed and people lives were lost because they didn't get the treatment they were supposed to get because they weren't allowed to yeah. how many lives were lost because of um, people in africa and other places in the world um these poverty stricken nations where they depend upon uh, the economy of america to even survive how many of those um kids mm -hmm. i mean you know there i mean we have basic health care stuff that sort of we just assume and that's not assumed over there and if you don't get it people die of malaria people die of these preventable diseases yeah and, mm -hmm. and millions of them did die because we shut everything down. It's not lives versus stuff. It's lives versus lives. And that's what this art article is missing. I think we're yet to see the long-term consequences of this. I think as bad as it is now, it's actually yeah. probably going to be worse when we look back. And I think it's yeah. going to be worse than even when we look back purely because I don't think things were recorded properly. One, because we weren't allowed to, we were censored. And two, people have been too afraid to um, report certain things or talk about their experiences because of the backlash, because of this um, horrendous backlash that mainstream media and other institutions have had. In Australia, um, we, we actually had um, an increase in suicide rates and depression for children. I, right. We wrote an article at Cauldron Pool um, that a five-year-old in the state of Victoria, which was the most lockdown state in the entire world. It was like something like, I think it was 300 and something days. Uh, it was something crazy. It beat all records. It was like Guinness World Book of Record, the most lockdown city ever for anything. Um, and a five-year-old rang the helpline for suicide, a five-year-old, like get that. Like, I don't know whether that's adults putting that on a five-year-old because anyone who's been around five-year-olds, I find that interesting however it's a recorded phone call that was released and it's quite confronting that that had such an effect lockdowns on that life like you mentioned toby it was lives versus lives and i think our children are probably going to suffer more than anyone else um which is terrifying because they're already on an uphill battle as is without all of this so my next question for you guys would be if you were the king, the emperor, if you were, if you were the boss, you were the governing bodies or you were in charge, like, how do you think the church should have responded to COVID from the get go? I was the political, like the political king or the, oh boy, Gabe or, just got happy. Or, or, we, or, we, we don't have like one or the other. This is like Christendom guys. So what, how would <laughs> <laughs> the Christian prince? <laughs> okay. That's right. <laughs> Clarifying. Oh, because she, because Evelyn, she's a Christian nationalist yeah, now, you know. Right. Can you believe him. that? That was like, that was like one of those posts that you do at like 2 a.m. in the morning when you get up to, you know, check, you hear a noise and you're like, what's that? And you get up and you just quickly check your phone. I'm like, I'm just going to do this non thought out tweet just as a funny thing. Cause I know the account isn't a yeah. real account. I know it's a bot. So I was like, I'm just going to do this. Woke up the next day, 3 million views. And I'm like, what is going on? And you know, you do those tweets and you're like, this is going to change the world. This is the most <laughs> profound thing I've ever done in my life. And you wake up in the morning, one retweet, three yeah. likes. Yeah. You're like, what? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, and then there's that's... nothing tweets. Anyway, sorry. So, uh, Christian Prince, how would you respond to co- what's the right way to do COVID for the church? Yeah, well, I think um, uh, first of all, if if you're a Christian politician, um, you don't tell the church what to do. Um, but I, you know, the job of a, a, a Christian politician is to incentivize those who are doing good and punish those who are evildoers. Um, so from that standpoint, you hold accountable all those people who stole, lied and cheated and killed during COVID. Um, and so the, the job of the, the civil sphere as a Christian politician is to kind of hold that, you know, wield the sword well, and then encourage the church to obey God and do right. Um, uh, but I mean, go back, go back to February, right at the yeah. end of February, right when COVID's about to happen, and you hear this possible two million people might die, kind of, you know, set up. How do you instruct? That'd be interesting to go back and run that. Um, so, uh, for us, the talk of COVID started happening in January 2020. We yeah. were on the road in in Georgia, and then in February, it the talk started, the buzz started getting going up and up, and then in March is when shutdown started happening for us here here in our country. Um, it was the liberal politicians were actually saying, "Oh, everything's fine. This is no big deal." I remember um, Cuomo saying, "Come to New York. The movie theaters are open. The restaurants are open." I remember the health district lady in New York saying, "Being at, she's in Chinatown." saying Chinatown's open. This right. all happened in February. Yeah. And then Fauci even said at the end of February, everything's fine. And then something happened. Remember like 10 days later, there's that, that yeah. shift on March 10th or something like that, where all the left started going, um, going crazy as I think the better way to approach this for us, at least because we have separation or are supposed to have um, a separation of powers between the federal government and the state government. I, I would have liked to have been governor mm-hmm. then um, because um, that, position was so important as a lot of the culture and the political willpower was leaning to shut down as a governor of my state i would have said no we're open it's the family's job to take care of their own health it is um uh uh, the church's job to make sure that their their prisoners are discipled on how to understand what the bible teaches about how the government should be involved or should not be involved in these sorts of things um now there, there might be a distinction. Maybe some of your listeners um, might not be, or this is how we make some distinction here. We believe the government has a limited role in pandemics. So they do have a role. In everything. And <laughs> and it, just like the government would, let's say, have a limited role if your house caught on fire. Um, if your house caught on fire, we have no problem with the government, you know, the fire station coming in and and saying, hey, your house is on fire. You guys need to get out now. Um, I don't have any problem with that kind of limited um, authority. Uh, and in the same way, if a town, if the bubonic plague came into our town, I have no problem with the government coming in and saying, okay, we need to get this under control. We need to lock down this town um, for a limited amount of time with limited authority because it's an emergency. Uh, I have no problem with the government's role in that, but it's a very accountable, limited role. And and the government doesn't have this um, sovereign power over that, even that limited situation. I would just add to that. I mean, I think um, getting to that, I agree with you, Gabe. I think the, the governor positions probably did turn out to be some of the most significant yeah. positions. Yeah. Um, I think the there, there were some um, draconian laws that came down or, or executive orders that came down from the federal government, but actually I think most of them came from governors of states. Yeah. Um, and um, and yeah. I think in addition to what you said, I think educating people, pointing them to um, I, um, the the appropriate role of civil magistrate, um, family government, church government. I would just say, like, I think r- like really cranking on getting good information out there. I think um, Ron DeSantis, um, governor of Florida, I think sort of belatedly did that. Um, we heard from uh, kind of like John MacArthur. Yeah, yeah. But I think I think Doctor um, Doctor Jay Bhattacharya was telling us that you know I don't know what month that was when he got the call from uh, from Governor DeSantis, but yeah. I think at some point something clicked for DeSantis and he realized, wait a second, um, this is wrong. This is wrong. I need to get good information. And he called uh, uh, Jay Bhattacharya and some other doctors into like a Zoom call and just started getting like, tell me the facts, tell me all the information. And 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 Doctor Jay is is like is actually like 
a little more conservative than I probably even am on yeah. some of this. Oh, like, yeah. and, and I appreciate that about him. He's, he's a humble scientist. And so he was even early on, he was asking questions, but he honestly wasn't being that like dogmatic. Like he, right. he wasn't saying like, we know he was just saying, we don't know. Yeah. And, and we shouldn't be making decisions based on what we don't know yet, but here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Here's the studies we need to do. He was yeah. calling, like he was calling out, like, let's do studies. He got one bit of funding and he did one study yeah, um, that, right. that like he was just talking about like the, the mortality rate. It's like the early um, uh, statistics we had weren't, we, they weren't based on scientific facts and right. studies. And he did one limited study in the LA Santa area. Santa Clarita? Yes, Is that what Santa it was? Clarita County yeah. or something like that. Like yeah. he did one limited study and it it suggested that the mortality rate wasn't as high as initially. But it was way lower. It was way lower. Yeah. But he said like we needed to do a bunch of those studies. But I think I think the a, a, a govern a governor could be at least um spearheading, encouraging the free inquiry. Yeah. Um good science yeah um like a spotlighting and platforming good scientists are asking good questions and saying please do this research helping get the information out there here's what we know so that husbands and fathers and pastors and elders That's right the actual people that god's put in charge of these these small governments of family and church can make good and faithful yeah. decisions for the people that they care about and don't be don't be like here's part of the uh, Story matters. Narrative matters. I mean, our mayor shut down our downtown like on March 20th or something like that, even before there's one COVID case in our county. Right. Like mm -hmm. these people immediately jumped to draconian um, decisions long before there was even any even good evidence on this yeah. virus, right. like long before. So the whole narrative of this thing matters significantly. And it, it just it demonstrates here in the U.S. at how uh, blind and how willing we were to go along with like this this fear driven narrative which is what they were all responding to they weren't responding to the facts of the virus they were responding to the the fear driven narrative narrative that the government figured out how to wield over time i i, I would just add to that as a leader i think what you want to do especially in times of trouble is make the people who are supposed to be responsible responsible yeah right yeah. that and this goes back to what pastor Tobe was saying yeah. a little bit of game if if i had to stand up there and say this like listen here's what we have we have this information that there's this virus and it's gotten here in America. We are going to do our very best to understand what kind of virus that we have. We're going to create opportunities for you guys to understand about this. But listen, if you're a man, you're responsible for your own home. Yep. If you're a man, you're responsible for your own business and company. These things are not ours. We didn't make these. We didn't build these. We can't shut them down. We can't shut them down. Yeah. You built them. You make the responsible choices for the environments that you live on and how to deal with them, okay? We are going to give you as many uh, pieces of elements of what's going on so you can make those decisions. That's our responsibility. And when we have an outbreak that is out of control, we are going to do what Leviticus requires. We're going to quarantine that area. And that area, particularly until we can come up with a solution or a conclusion that is no more dangerous to the rest of everybody else, outside of that, operate freely, yeah. live well with each other, and love each other properly. But that is within you guys' context of, of the community to make those decisions. And then you make people responsible for the things they're supposed to be. Listen, and, and that you don't stop information that's helpful. That was one of the most horrible things. Vitamin D. Vitamin C, yeah. zinc, um, sunshine, sunshine outside, walking, exercise, hydroxy, exercise. All those things were things that were, you couldn't yeah. tell people that that was, hey, this is how you have a good immune system. YouTube was censoring people doing that. Right. YouTube yeah. censored, censored us multiple times, just even having some of these basic conversations. And they were doing it through the arm of the federal government. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, we can keep going for a long time. One last thing I'll just throw out there is I think part of the reason for this, I don't People maybe don't always connect the dots, but emphasizing the responsibility of particular men for their particular families, yes. for their particular churches, for their particular businesses, for their local communities. The point of this is that the Bible teaches that the people closest to those individuals love them the best. That's right. right. What we're talking about is who loves people the best. That's right. Well, I love my family the best. Mm -hmm. I love my church the best. That's right. And and what they're asking us to do in a moment like this where they say in the name of crisis, the governor, the mayor, the health district, whatever is saying no, we can love all these people that we don't even know mm. the best. And that's a lie. That's fundamentally a lie. It's just not true. It's not the way God made the world. Um you love the people you know and care about the best, the people that are closest to you and you are in the best position 
to protect them and provide for them. That's what the Bible teaches. That's right. I think we live in a culture or, you know, nations that just lack all responsibility. And I think this is why the government um, has been able to run rampant for so long. People actually in an odd way like it because if they're not personally responsible, when something goes wrong, they can just point their finger and blame somebody else. They yeah. don't like to be personally responsible and, and hold those decisions on their shoulders and then be personally responsible for if they get it wrong as well. Right. Um, and I think that's a real cultural thing that needs to change i think once that changes i think that there will be a lot of good fruit to come from that but um you um, know i, I think something, evelyn can yeah, i add go for it yeah so, you know, i think responsibility um first comes from our responsibility to god our duty to confess our own sins take responsibility for our own sins so you have this individual manifestation of re responsibility to everyone from me to my wife to my kids so we're all responsible for god for our sin but i think there's also a particular a particular cultural responsibility that's driven particularly by men. Um, uh, responsibility is a, a particular man um, trait that they need to take responsibility for their families. They need to take responsibility for their leadership of their church. They need to take responsibility for you know the duties that God has put before them out in the world. And and as you um, disincentivize or discourage masculinity, you're doing that very thing of disincentivizing and discouraging responsibility in society yeah um yeah and i think that's it, cre it creates that's right. that blame culture that's that you're right. talking about in that victim culture that's a very feminine thing to do to be honest we us women <laughs> love to <laughs> love to shift the blame it, it is though um and god is a patriarchal god so i totally agree with what you said gabe 100 well don't let adam get away with it he shifted the blame too so yeah. you know <laughs> he's acting that, that was the beginning of of the fall for him that's, yeah, that's right. right. Um, but look, you know, I'd love to get into why you think the church failed so much, but I feel like that's an episode in itself because I feel like that's not really a, a surface level quick one yeah. answer here. Like there's, there's a lot of spiritual problems, not just with the church, but with Christians. And I think that that's part of why the church failed so much, but I'm aware of the time and I'm aware that we're going to try and wrap it up. So I wanted to finish with the, latest uh i guess lead up to the election over in america um i have a real interest in american politics i think that a lot of what happens there flows down to us like you said you guys had first lockdowns in february ours sort of came around march like we kind of follow sort of shortly after you guys even though we're very different so i have an interest and i'm just looking at what's going on leading up for like the republican party and i'm just like wow this is like cult versus cult versus cult. You've got the MAGA cult, you've got the DeSantis cult, and now you've got like the Kennedy cult. And I'm like, I honestly have no idea who I would vote for or what I would do. Because if you vote for Trump, you're, you're a vaccine shill. If you vote for DeSantis, you're an Israel shill. And if you vote for Kennedy, you're a climate emergence shill. And I'm like, I don't know what I'd do. What, yeah. what do you, like, how do you see this latest election playing out? Like, I'm I'm planning to vote for Knox. <laughs> <laughs> I would another, do that too. That's, one, that's good. <laughs> you're another president a week. In like 24 yeah, hours. Like 24 like, hours the Christian yeah. prince. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, don't do that to me. Um, uh, I, I've been, I don't know. I've been thinking about this between just my decision to me is more between like uh, Trump and DeSantis. Because um, I think that's actually more the realistic decision what's going to come down to in the Republican primaries next May. Um, I, I think I can consciously vote for DeSantis based on like the moral qualifications the Bible presents. I don't think I can vote for Trump on those moral qualifiers. Um, I'm, uh, at this point, unless narrative or things change and more information comes, I'm voting for DeSantis as much as I would like to see Trump, uh, get reelected and kind of, you know, when you get knocked off a horse, you want to get back on that horse. I, I, there's an element that I want to see. Just for his with, speeches uh, alone. Would be 100%. <laughs> and how he handles the media. I mean, there's so much yeah. um, but Trump, you know, so for example, Trump, uh, he already is trying to split the difference between Ron DeSantis and, and the broader Republican base. For example, Trump now says he's against the six week abortion ban. Um, well, I, I can't, uh, you know, DeSantis is is for it. You know, DeSantis is working harder in some areas where uh, Trump uh, recently said uh, 
uh oh man what was it that he recently did there's a similar situation well, he hasn't backed down on covid the COVID, the COVID policy mm. sounds very good policies at all he still says operation warp speed was his thing yeah he's yeah. he's still bragging I got about it done no the president could do it yeah, yeah that's right and, yeah and i and i think that's I and mean, he's every time he brings that up i it's like another you know I, i'm 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 like right. well fine i'll vote for chocolate knox yeah and and i and i would <laughs> Why'd you that kill if, me? <laughs> if trump showed a little bit of um macarthur humility i would mm. vote over him over on the santos any day so this is interesting you know in 2016 you we didn't we didn't even know we needed a trump right mm. we didn't know how much we needed a trump yeah. trump comes in here and exposes yeah. everybody the left the right the whole nine and if it wasn't for trump i don't think you would even get a desantis mm. okay mm. um yeah, and so true. and i don't think you would get a Unfortunately, I don't even think you would get a Ted Cruz as bold as he is. And so I think it's yeah. it's a kindness of God to give us both Trump and DeSantis as an option right now. But the question I keep answering, it's, I'm not answering the qualifications of the leader right now. I, I probably I, I'm thinking about those, but I'm asking the question, if we're in the time of judges, what type of judge do we currently need in order to uproot the cancer that we currently have? And I'm watching both and to see who's really going to uproot the cancer. And then who's going to uproot it or get all the cancer out in such a way that it doesn't leave room for another, uh, when you cast a demon out, you get seven more to come back. We don't feel it. Yeah. Yeah. Who's gonna feel it. So you got one guy who looks like he might do a decent enough job cleaning out some stuff, but I don't know if he's going to be able to fill it. The other guy, I see what he's filling it with, but I don't know if he knows how to get all the yeah. stuff out. <laughs> you know, mm, and so yeah. if I'm, I'm in a weird place where I'm watching both and I'm like, can we just have a double ticket? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we need both of these guys work together. Trump and the Panthers, they kill each other. That, yeah. Well, maybe that might be good for all of us. <laughs> no they pray for you. It might be good for the nation that they fight. You know, yeah. I don't know. But I'm I, honestly, I really don't know at this point who uh, I could vote for in in lineup with all those different, um, you know, with those different options. I know we have a lot of cancer that needs to get cleaned out, and I, DeSantis is he'll fight. And I, I appreciate his fight, but I don't know if he knows how to fight in such a way. Trump's money has helped him survive some of the fight. Right. Right. And, and engagement. He, he doesn't care. And he, he doesn't, doesn't care. care yeah, right. He's, he's like, I've got more money where yeah. that came from. I don't care. Right. And so we I'm it's it's hard to pick a, a good bad yeah. judge, right? And, and then and then he got yeah. mentioned uh Kennedy yeah. uh coming out of the yeah. out of left field, you know, who's this there's a lot of fun. Sort he's of a distraction. Class, yeah, I think I think probably so. But um, you know, a distraction for the left, not for us. Yeah, but it's I, a good distraction. He's on like, live on Twitter at the moment, actually. With yeah, Elon. No, with Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's yeah. a good distraction. Yeah, I appreciate so, him. Yeah, pray for us though. <laughs> yeah. I, I am. I'm just going to stay away from the summer of love whenever the election's on. Um, that's scary times. But um, just quickly before we wrap up, how are you calling it? Is it going to be Democrat or Republican for the next win? You go first, Toby, and work your go around. I'm going to hold you to this, by the way, guys. So be careful. Uh, yeah. Right. Um, uh, without thinking about it very much, I think a Democrat's going to be the office next. I, that's exactly what I think. It depends if uh, Republicans are willing to harvest ballots. <laughs> <laughs> Great point. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to hold you to that. Come it's next legal. election. Because COVID, it's yeah, legal. It's legal. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. You've heard it. Awesome. I've heard it here first. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. I'd love to chat with you about more things, but I think that's been a really good, um, you know, way to sort of get into politics and the cross and looking at it through a biblical lens. So I'm really grateful. Uh, where can people follow your show and where can they go to watch it? Uh, crosspolitic.com. Cross uh, they can also download our app, which is Fight, Laugh, Feast app in your app store and, you know, Twitter and facebook and youtube as long as they don't censor us <laughs> awesome thanks again for coming on all the best and um i'll be praying for your country as it moves forward um especially with the elections moving uh, thank you for thanks having so. us thanks so much, appreciate it. It.